first of all, thank you so much. I think Rishikesh sir has always been super kind to give us an opportunity to come back to the university. I am a graduate of 2014 from BCom, BCom regulars. I don't know if it's still called the same, but when we were there back then, there were about four branches of BCom, regulars, honors, tourism, etc. So I'm a 2014 graduate, and the only way for us to stay connected to the university are opportunities like this. Uh, we can always come back, visit the university, but it's an amazing feeling to come back and be able to give back and pay it forward. This is not something that we get every day. So whenever Rishikesh sir calls me or pings me, I just hop onto the opportunity. So thank you for that, sir. So always grateful. Uh, a little bit introduction about myself. Like I said, I'm a 2014 graduate from BCom. After that, I joined Ernst & Young. It was a college placement. I was a US tax analyst for about three years. And then I moved to the startup ecosystem. Um, I wanted to move out of the corporate world. At least back then, when we graduated, the startup ecosystem was not this noisy around us. Success back then meant getting into a big four and we thought our life was all sorted i mean it's a good opportunity i'm, I'm not saying it is not but sometimes you also want to do more try something more exciting and something more that not um everybody out there is trying to get to uh, when i moved to the startup ecosystem i wasn't very sure of the chance that i was taking or the opportunity i was getting into because not a lot of people were getting into the ecosystem back then but I did. I just trusted the process and I joined this PropTech Accelerator program, uh, an accelerator program focused on real estate startups. So this is by the builders group called Brigade in South India. And they had initially started out and I joined their founding team. I was there for about three years. And uh, that's where the entire entrepreneurship spirit got into me. I always wanted to own something of my own, build something of my own. That kind of joy is something else, but I never knew where to get started. But when I worked in this particular organization, the kind of people that I was surrounded with were extremely encouraging and motivating. There were people older to me building something, people my own age building something, people younger to me building something. There was somebody at the age of 60 just starting a tech startup. There was somebody at the age of 20 who had already scaled up a startup. And to just be around them was so much learning and so much motivation and push to have something of your own. That's when I started Evora, which is called Evora today. But back then when I started, it was called Element. So I should probably start the story as Element. I always had a creative side. I wanted to bring that to life because my professional journey has been a mix of finance and program management. The only way for me to live my creative side was to bring out and create something of my own. So I started this candle brand. Um, when I started, there were not many candle brands around me. and. Um, the only reason I chose this line was for me to also keep my creativity alive. There were not many workshops available. I'm a self-taught candle maker. I watched a lot of YouTube videos. It's not rocket science, but it wasn't as easy as I thought it would be as well. It took me about six to seven months to get my first candle right. Um, starting with the size of the wick that you should use for a certain size of the candle, how it burns down, what should be the size of the flame, what kind of fragrances to add. I didn't even know there were so many kind of different waxes that are available out there. So that's how it started. Um, I'll just quickly complete my introduction before I dive deeper into the story. But yeah, after that's when I started. But after that, I took a break for my master's. And I came back to Christ again and I did my master's in entrepreneurship, innovation um, and entrepreneurship. And we were the first batch. Um, that's when I got a little more serious about it. I built it out. And today I have moved to Bombay from Bangalore. So I also work. I work in a venture capital firm on the Capital Networks team. And um, this 
session is also an opportunity for me to actually voice out the challenges that I'm facing and also learn from you guys and understand from you guys your thought process and perspective around how you see the current world and entrepreneurship as well. So before I dive in, I would just like to understand um, what kind of courses are you all coming from, which year uh, do you all belong to? Um, it'll just help me structure and point out a little more things specifically. Rishikesh, sir, sorry if I'm ask, repeating this question from the past, but I would just like to get a glance on what course the students belong to. All are master's students in their second year. Okay, what course would this be? MCOM. MCOM program. MCOM. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, so like I said, I started uh, Illumin when I was in RE. Brigade Reap when I was working for the PropTech Accelerator. Um, it took me about six months to get the product. How I strategized my initial days was I created the product and I gave it out to a lot of folks around me to get initial set of honest feedback. Of course, from some friends, you might not get real feedback. So I went out there and I distributed some free samples to whoever I could and I pestered them, called them, messaged them and understood what did they like about the product and what they did not like about the product. And one thing for me to also make sure was to create something that was unique from the other brands out there. It's slightly easier for you to think through what kind of differentiation would you want to bring in a tech product. But in a direct to consumer product, you should always innovate with your story and the product line um and the kind of features that you bring into the product so i was trying to understand what's already out there in the market and what can i build differently the kind of sense that i introduced was specific to indian authenticity and i wanted to stick to it um, I went and fetched, tried and fetched some of the best scents out there, and that still is the USB of my product. There are a lot of um, candle brands today coming up, but one reason why folks still come back to me was or is because of my scents and because of the kind of creativity that I brought into each product. For instance, I also created a candle that was a feather edition where it was colorful and it had some actual feathers embedded into the candle. And this was not something that was available in the market. So I would sit and try and experiment um, a lot of things around the product and the product styling itself. And that's something that worked well for me. Um, to get into the market, I started setting up stalls. I set up stalls in some apartments, some universities, some flea markets. And I was just trying to understand how do people or consumer react when they the first instinct of the product when they see it offline, because until then I was selling it completely online. I started off with an Instagram page until not recently I had not created a website. So my first initial customer touch point, direct customer touch point after Instagram was these stalls. I was just trying to understand what is the consumer perception of candle in India itself. And this gave me an idea and sense of what kind of market should I target to. In India, candle still today is not considered as an essential. If you compare it to a lot of countries outside, maybe European market or even US, candle, buying candles is more like buying groceries for them. But that, not, well, that was not the case when I started off back here in India. There were Gen Z's who were into candles and there were like high net worth individuals who wanted to like do up their house, home decor people who wanted candles. But there was a large portion of the population who were in between this, who really didn't believe in the need for candles, right? So it's always about creating a must have product over a good to have product. So mine was a good to have product for the Indian market. 
So I really had to crack the strategy on how do I go and get into the minds of the consumer and break it through. So that is something I really struggled with initially to understand. And my initial customer feedbacks helped me build some amount of conviction. So when folks come back to me for my to place the return purchase, I tried and understood why were they coming back to me. And like I said, um, the fragrance and the style, the design of the candle was something that was working well for me. And I doubled down on that. I doubled down on that and try and created a lot more options. And something that also I learned through the journey was good candles were somewhere in the premium range. So I also tried and introduced a range which fell into the affordable category, but also gave a premium look and a premium effect to the consumers who were buying it. And another use case for candles largely, apart from home, was also gifting. And this affordable range came in super handy for that because be it weddings or be it birthday parties, baptism, folks came to me asking for customized candles. They wanted something premium, something that smells really good. But at the same time, they wanted something that fit into their budget range. So I introduced a starting price at just 80 bucks and I did maximum customization for that. Even today, I don't have really high margins on that. But even today, that's something that sells the most. So my that category became a volume game. And that also brought in a lot more customers for me, which eventually also cut, converted into like B2C individual product line customers who would come and purchase my premium products. Right. This was the first couple of years of getting into the business. By then, there were a lot of players like me who were emerging and who were coming up in the market. So I had to really think through and place and position this in the market in a way that really stood out from the other competitors and also created a threat to the new people that were entering into the market. So like I said, it's always a good to have versus a must have product. Since this is a good to have product, a consumer product mostly is about how a consumer feels when they buy it. How can you really have the touch point with those consumers and what makes them want to come back to it? It's the story that you sell, unlike a tech product, right? So I built around the story of it. And that's when I, this was during COVID. I revamped the entire strategy and I thought through how could I uh, build a narration around it that also resonated with the consumers that purchased my product. So if you, um, if you can recollect, if you can resonate, um, when, okay, you all might have something really uh, something favorite that your mothers prepare for you back at home, right? Like some dish for some people, it could be a sweet, some people, it could be a dessert, it could be sambar, it's just some curry that they make. But there's some dish that your mom makes that really resonates with you. And say you go to a restaurant, you walk into a restaurant tomorrow and you get the smell of the exact same dish. It recalls those moments back home when your mom prepares it. It could be your family dining together. It could be you just sitting in the kitchen and having this dish with your mother by the side, anything, right? That's how he, we human beings are built. Taste and smell are directly related to our emotions. So it's directly related to the memories. And every time you smell something, something familiar, it brings back the memories. So now that you know this piece of information, try and validate it next time over the next few days and you'll try and understand what I'm trying to say. So I built the strategy of my product line around this. So I renamed it from Illumin to Evora. So Evora means evoking an aura. So every time you lit 
a candle from Evora in your house. I wanted the consumers to feel the warmth in the house. And I wanted them to bring back an emotion, uh, bring back a memory that deeply resonated with them. And that's the story I sold. And that's how I tried and connected with my B2C customers. And the kind of sense that I brought in, for example, I'm from Cook, and coffee is something that we all, um, it, it's, it's super common in Cook, and that's something I resonate with. And I have my certain set of memories around coffee and i know coffee is something that is dear to most people in many ways irrespective of what parts of the country or the world you come from so i introduced a coffee edition of candle with embedded coffee beans in it but i also wrote a story around it and that was my packaging um sorry i don't have a fancy deck or presentation to put up but i can share some pictures and materials with you guys post this call so I also brought in Jasmine. Jasmine, probably, when I say Jasmine, it brings me a picture of, say, Madurai, uh, where folks in the market uh, is filled with Jasmine flowers. And there are ladies around buying fresh flowers early in the morning uh, or temples. So I used all these elements and I designed the packaging of a jasmine candle, which narrated the story. And you, as I'm trying to tell the story, try and imagine it, I'm lighting the candle and you have the story around the jar and this fragrance also sets in that narrative or vibe in your minds. So this is a strategy that I use to sell my products and it's fortunately been working for me. And uh, this kind of sense I brought in, uh, for example, there's also sandalwood that there's a very traditional temple theme that I've brought in for my sandalwood candle because sandalwood is something that you use in the temples. So every fragrance I bought in, I just didn't sell it as a mere fragrance. I sold a story along with every fragrance, right? And that is something that really helped me stand out from other brands in the market where they were making the products, there were different designs, there were different fragrances, but the touch point with the consumers was something that really worked for me. So this has been the strategy so far. Um, the business was largely or primarily based out of Bangalore. I was in Bangalore. I've recently moved to Bombay and the business has moved with me. I'll come to the challenge part of it. By the way, if you all want to stop me and ask me questions, please feel free. I'm happy to take questions in between. Um, so I've moved to Bombay and I'm still trying to figure out how to base the business out of here. I would still call myself a small business. I started this in my own house in Bangalore. And that's how I continued. Eventually, I got a slightly larger space adjacent to my house, and I used to do, make it out of there. Everything had worked out well. I had staffs who would come and help me when I have larger orders. I'd crack the delivery part of it. it, it it's not hard. It was not hard. Uh, but the real estate in Bangalore versus Bombay is slightly different. It's not very easy to find spaces in Bombay. That would be my challenge number one. And I'm still a solo entrepreneur who also has um, another job. And uh, this is something that brings me deeper joy. And this is something that I want to continue to build and I want to retire to this. The primary challenge that I'm facing today is to establish it in the same way in Bombay, like how I had established it in Bangalore. It's not impossible, but space is a constraint. Uh, it will still take me two years to build the kind of manpower that I had built in Bangalore. That is a problem number two, and I don't have that kind of time to build this out. One option was to move manufacturing elsewhere and maintain the business part of it here for which I'll have to move to the other location, train people and come back and have a support staff there. So that is an option, but that is the challenge in moving the operations elsewhere and doing the business part of it from, some, from somewhere else. 
So currently, I'm still trying to figure things out logistically on how should I map this or how should I base this business from Bombay while I still continue to cater to the rest of the country. The larger vision is to also expand into exports because in India, the market is still a little raw. While there is tremendous opportunity, it is growing. There's a early conviction for candles in the country and the whole perspective about candles is changing. And I would also like to introduce multiple different varieties of product line like scents, um, incense sticks, etc. But the ultimate uh, long term objective is also expand into exports and export to countries that have higher demand. Um, so that is something I would like to figure out. But before doing that, I would like to logistically crack the change of location of the business itself, which has, yes, affected the business to some extent today. And that's something I'm looking to solve. And this is a brief overview. Um, I just kept it short so that I can give a quick um, glimpse of it in a few minutes instead of having a longer monologue. I would like to pause for a minute and take questions if you'll have so that I can structure the rest of the story accordingly. Uh, thank you, Sanjana. It was truly inspiring. Uh, before I invite students, I have a couple of questions uh, because uh, yes, you said uh, sustainability is a big focus for Vibora. Right. Um, can you explain uh, some of the specific sustainable practices you've implemented in, in, in your manufacturing, in your packaging, or whatever things you've done to ensure yeah. sustainability? Yeah. Um, so there are different varieties of waxes that come in candles. One is soy wax, one is paraffin wax, you have beeswax, etc. Paraffin wax are these regular white candles that you see at home. So these are these regular candles that you get in any shops. But the largest disadvantage of this is it's made out of petroleum products. This wax is made out of petroleum products. And when you light this, the amount of carbon soot it releases to the environment is much larger than any other kind of waxes. So we use 100% soy wax. It's an extract of soybean, which is 100% organic. We also try and use essential oils and not industrial oils. But this is still a transition that we're trying to do. The only challenge is in organic scents. The scent throw is still not that strong when compared to industrial scents. And this is something that we're trying to solve for. Even the wicks that we use, there are wax coated wicks when you say wax coated wicks it's again wax coated with paraffin wax but we use plain cotton wicks that you might see a lot of folks use in their house for the hours. um even with respect to packaging we try and use paper materials we try and procure recycled paper materials we are not 100 percent transitioned into this but this is an effort that we are trying to consciously make as well even for example with paper fillers etc instead of procuring fillers right from the scratch we try and recycle what we have to make these fillers so to a large extent at every step we try and go as sustainable as possible but the largest sustainability aspect comes in with the kind of wax that we use and that soy wax and we do not promote paraffin wax and although it's a lot cheaper um, that's one of the reasons why our price point is at what it is. And we try to cater at different price points to just to make up for this because uh, soy waxes are like 4x the cost of paraffin wax just because of how organic it is. Uh, but this is not a compromise that we have tried to make. All right. And um, while going through your profile, um, I got to know that Ivora got recognized by Radio 1 and Indian Express in Dalj. Uh, yes, what, what sort of an impact did this recognition have on your brand? Um, OK, I would uh, like to state this out with a 
slight story. I'll also probably phrase this in a way which helped me believe in my work, which might, I hope it brings a certain level of inspiration to everybody listening. Uh, so I first listed this candle brand in this platform called LBB. So LBB is present at a city level to give you, it's like yellow pages, gives you all the information that you need about a certain city, be it the kind of places you have to visit, um, maybe hospital recommendations, whatever, everything, right? So it lists down all the gifting options that you have, all the home decor options that you have. So I was still very, very new and early into starting this. It was not even a brand back then, but I wanted to try to go and list this on LBB so that I get some initial traction and some people start recognizing my products, but I didn't know how to reach out to them. And I didn't really think it would work out for me, but what's the harm in trying, right? And this is where I said, it's always about giving that a shot. I went to their Instagram page and I dropped a message. I shared a few pictures to them and then said, this is what I do. These are the pictures. I do not have a website, but these are the details. Please tell me uh, what more do you need and what's the process of listing it on LBB. I'm not sure even if I even qualify for it. And within five minutes, I got a response to that, right? And in a week, I was listed on LBB. And for me, in that moment, it was a win because I, I was not even a brand back then. I was just somebody sitting at home and trying to create something of my own. But the larger piece of it, and I'm somebody who always believe that opportunities don't knock at your door. And if somebody has told you otherwise, I would like to correct it. You go out there, take chances, create opportunities for yourself. And these chances that you take in the future, create some opportunities. Two months down the lane, I get a call from Radio One and they said, we found you on LBB. Would you like to come and uh, have a conversation with us at Radio One? Because we have selected your brand as one of the top five gifting options in the sustainability space for this Diwali. And for somebody that small, it made a huge difference, right? And I went to them and um, we had a small conversation on Radio one and they covered some features of mine the kind of products that we do it was a good moment and uh, uh it, it came out on radio and etc but the larger part of it is um, a few months down the lane i think it was around christmas i get another call and they say we want to feature we found you on radio one and we would like to feature you on indian express not me, but the brand um, for the kind of uh, artistic designs that we have, because this is not something that we see in a lot of other candle brands. And that's how the whole Indian Express happened. And through these things, answering to your question, sir. So a lot of um, inbound interest came to me and it helped me create a position in the market that I otherwise would have really struggled to. And uh, we have not really spent any money on these marketing or um, features. It was something that came to us and we even couldn't afford to spend at that point. And uh, this really helped us position our brand as something that is quality driven when compared to other candle brands in the market. And yeah, it did give us some amount of traction and push for the brand, brand at large. All right. And uh, um, how do you balance, since you mentioned about the aesthetics and the functional aspect of the candles, uh, how do you balance that aesthetic and the functional aspects of your candles to create a product uh, that appeals to both the senses and the emotions? Of course, you did uh, quote a few examples of uh, people in Tamil Nadu, but, um, you know, connecting or relating with Jasmine, or, or maybe those in Kurg might easily relate with coffee, uh, but by and large, how do you ensure the balance of the aesthetics and the functional aspect of your can candles? Yeah. Um, so when you say aesthetics, uh, I would also like to highlight on the design element. It does take a quite an amount of iterations to crack a final product. For example, even this feather candle that worked out really well for us. So 
we have feathers around the candle, like real actual feathers embedded. Few, uh, so we launched the product, it worked well. Uh, we gave it out to some initial samples. And then we got an initial set of feedback saying the feathers also burn with the candle, right? And then we have to we had to think, okay, how do we do this? So we had to reduce the flame. So to reduce the flame, we had to reduce the size of the wick. But if we reduce the size of the wick a little too much, it will also not have a complete burn. If you see, sometimes candles go hollow at the center. And once it starts going hollow, the wax around the candle doesn't melt. So that is also something we had to solve for scientifically. So we thought, okay, maybe two tiny wicks so that the flames are distant, smaller flames across instead of having one large flame, which will spread the heat and burn the feathers also. And that's how we cracked that. So this is subjective to every kind on every candle that we bring. And um, with, with respect to the fragrance, like I said, what's worked really well for us is trying to connect to the consumers on based on the kind of need that they have for example there was a pub in bangalore that came to us and asked if you can create a candle for us on beer fragrance right and we want to do that because we don't want to mix it up with an any other kind of sense like a jasmine or um sandalwood in a pub but we want beer or we want something like cinnamon anything related to food or drinks or beverages right so we do get requests like that also where we try and customize. Since we don't make the sense in-house, we have to go back to our vendors, our partners who develop these scents. And it took us a good two to three months to develop a scent like that and infuse it into our candles and it worked out well. So we do get requests like some good requests, some difficult requests. We try and solve for it. Somebody wanted a candle that smells like rain. Uh, the good part about it is with sense, there's a huge scope of experiment that we can do. Uh, it is possible to get sense of various degrees and uh, classifications, but the scientific formation of it is something that we have to dig deeper and crack, and that is something that takes time. But in most cases, luckily, we have been successful until now in cracking the kind of sense that we need. Okay. Um, you know, I'm also interested uh, in what ways do you see Evora evolving in the future? And is there any product or initiatives that you're really excited about? Because you've also switched to another new city, which is throwing open a lot of opportunities for you. Where yeah. do you see yourself evolving in the future? Um, so something that we have realized as a brand is candles are something that has worked well for us while we continue to do, uh, continue to uh, keep that in the market. We should also expand into different verticals. We are currently also trying to study what kind of products related to this specific domain would the Indian market actually be interested in. Um, we are trying to do scents and home fragrances that are so incense sticks is one way of it what other forms this is still something we are experimenting what other forms of a sense can we keep in the house and how should the functionality of it work we are also trying to experiment with fabric scents uh scents for your wardrobes uh, sense for your uh, couches, etc. And how can this be except for the space that you do? Is there any other form of sense that we could do? So expansion of product line is something that we are currently focusing on. And um, once we have solved the challenge of the functionality and the logistics of existing in a different city, we want to focus and double down on the product line that we are trying to expand it to. I would now invite uh, the students if you have any questions to ask uh, Sanjana. Um, if you have any reluctance uh, in asking, unmuting and asking, you can even type your questions in the chat window. I can read out the questions on your behalf. 
any quick questions so we also have our hod dr amal nathan sir here good evening sir good evening sir any questions sure okay. adika go ahead Uh, you are working a full time job and as well uh, maintaining your business and since you mentioned that uh, you are trying to expand your business towards the uh, essence uh, essence and all that uh, would you uh, rather go on a full time uh, focusing on your business or would you continue working in your uh, full time job i knew this question would come so as an entrepreneur if you take my word for it i would insist that you completely focus on your venture i am a greedy person i want everything so i'm trying to crack into two different verticals at the same time and i love my job a little too much to let go of it but at the same time i love my venture too and that's why i'm trying to crack this my idea is to establish a fully functional team that drives things by itself and continue doing my job but if you if i have to give an advice to you i would say focus on entrepreneurship or focus on your job do one thing don't do two things at a time and uh, sorry your second part of the question about incense sticks was I mean, I was just asking that since you're uh, planning to expand your business, wouldn't that be more, uh, you know, uh, what do you say? It would be time-consuming for you as well, and you would. It will be. Okay. Um, the downside of it is it'll take a longer time for me to crack it. Had I been doing just one thing, I could have done it twice as faster, and the. Uh, price i'm paying for it is that it takes a longer time for me to crack into some of the things that i could have done faster if i was doing just one thing it is time consuming it takes a few hours of your sleep as well but at the end of the day entrepreneurship entrepreneurship is also a lot of the passion that you bring to the table and for me this has been my passion and love towards creating something of my own and i i love doing this and that's why i do it thank you ma'am thank you thank you for the question any other questions can feel free to ask or as i said uh, even type your questions in the chat window okay if not uh, i would invite amal nathan sir thank you sir thank you sanjana thank you sir yeah so i hope you know all our students you know had a wonderful you know and listening to you and uh, the story or uh, the uh, life journey that you have shared with us would inspire you know many of them in different ways you know some might even you know venture into doing some business as you have led you know but also uh, our students would come back to you uh, with more queries in person or over calls to understand further no uh, because as they are in the process of writing cases so they would you know uh, sometime you know uh, disturb you please you know don't mind no, and, no, it's, uh, okay. it's not disturbance it's a privilege so. okay okay yeah. so uh, we have been asking them you know to interact with entrepreneurs and um, you know in a way we are also arranging you know people like you to come and talk to our students so that they get you know to know how entrepreneurs you know uh, survive and you know excel in their you know doing businesses and uh, this is one such you know initiative or activity that we are organizing in the department so thank you very much from the department you know for your you know um, uh, time and uh, your valuable insights and your sharing of your you know life journey uh, so thank you so much sanjana 
Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. Like I said initially as well, it's a tremendous opportunity to be associated with the university that you have studied. And these are the only ways that we get an opportunity to do that. So whenever I get the chance, I just jump into it. I think we have one more question on the chat, sir. Yes, Netra had uh, typed, as you had mentioned, getting into the big four is success for most of us. How was the transition from big four to starting something of your own? Don't um, quote me negatively when I say I want I wanted to transition out of a big four. Big four is still a great opportunity to be out there. And if that is what your dream is, you should definitely go for it. But this is my personal opinion and it could be subjective. While entrepreneurship looks fancy on the outside, it's also a lot of emotional bandwidth that goes into it in case of jobs as well but in entrepreneurship the thing is you are responsible for the success or failure of it right and you are responsible for the success or failure of the people that work with you and the business so it is there'll be days you feel amazing about cracking something and there'll be days that you feel really horrible when something doesn't go well. I still remember when I started off how disappointed I was when a stall of mine didn't do well. And it took me about two to three days to just get over it. So everything has its own set of challenges, pros and cons. Um, the transition was not very... I mean, um, because I did it simultaneously, um, it wasn't very hard hitting for me because I was simultaneously doing both the things. But I would say, if I had to say, pick something that makes your heart happy. Um, don't pick things just because this is something you have to do and this is something that you're expected to do. Some people recognize opportunities faster, some people recognize opportunities later, and in both the cases, it's okay. As long as you find something good to do and it keeps you happy, that should be something you should focus on. And um, for me, like I said, the transition specifically happened a little smoothly because I also was working and i was trying to build this out so i so i would be home by when i joined the accelerator program i would be home by six to seven o'clock and after that i would work on my venture and i would work on my venture over the weekends right and when i transitioned from a big four to a startup ecosystem i had to really trust the process because not a lot of people did this back then Today, startup ecosystem is considered like a big opportunity, but it wasn't back then. Only people who really knew what they were doing probably moved from a big four. But I sort of trusted the process and that helped me go with it. So, yeah, but neither of it is a bad opportunity. It's always about what works for you. Sanjana, you also mentioned that you've invested very less in marketing and promotion and you believed in uh, creating narratives, creating uh, or uh, making stories. Um, so what role does storytelling and memories play in the creation of your candles? And, you know, if there is any interesting example of a scent that tells a unique story uh, from your journey so far, if you could share it with us, it becomes more relatable. Yeah. Uh, so the first question, part of the question was on marketing, I suppose. Yeah. Um, marketing is necessary. I won't completely rule it out because you have to do a certain amount of shelling out to reach the consumers, especially because there are so many brands out there today. But the thing is, when you reach out to them, how do you reach out to them is where the story lies. Um, if I had to give you an example, I don't have the pictures. I wish I could show you the pictures. But um, like I explained the coffee scent. So how the story of the coffee scent, how the packaging of the coffee scent worked was 
there was a lady in the coffee estate plucking coffee so that was one part of it for some reason who come from um malnad regions that is something they could resonate to and for some people that is the first thing they want in the morning so we had like a window somebody sitting by the window and sipping their coffee and for some people during their work coffee is something that keeps them going so we also had a work aspect to it and we just wrote a little narration around this to add to it so if say you are a person who wants coffee while you're working i'm a person who loves coffee when as soon as i wake up in the morning when i light the candle in the morning i will resonate to that feeling now say i light the candle in even in the evening it will bring me back that memory and that emotion i feel in the morning when i drink coffee right similarly to you for you if it is something that keeps you energized that keeps you going so whenever you light that candle you probably feel a lot more energized and motivated to do more and that's how fragrances work and that's how once you have associated yourself to a certain fragrance that emotion is deeply rooted in you so whenever you get that fragrance that is the feeling you get that is the feeling that puts you at rest i hope i was able to explain <laughs> Yes, you did. Uh, Sanjana, you also said uh, you are a sole entrepreneur. And yeah. uh, was these stories written by you or uh, you had a team to work on? Or how did you create the content? Um, and one more ad adding on, uh, why had you remained as a solo entrepreneur? Why didn't you ever think of a co-founder? OK, um, the narration part of it was me. Um, I, when I say was me, I had to resonate with whatever I sell. So that was the angle I came from. If I am putting something on the table, I had to be connected with it. But I did have designers and people who helped me put together my thoughts. Well, I told this is what I want to feel about this candle. I had designers who sat and designed that for me to bring out that story. And the solo entrepreneur part of it, the main reason I did not go for it was because I hadn't fully ventured myself into it. While that could have been also the reason why I should have gone to it. Um, I thought maybe until I place this business in the market completely as a single source of truth, I wouldn't want to engage somebody else in it. I wanted to be sure the kind of commitment I put into it before I sign up somebody else. But so better than solo entrepreneurs is always somebody more than one entrepreneur. Even when we look at funding, we look at people, uh, at least with two founders, uh, more than just one founder. Are there any questions from students or If not, uh, I just had a, OK, I think there's one more. Netra has asked, uh, after COVID-19, there has been a lot of small scale businesses that have come up with creating similar products. Was there any change in your business strategy to set you apart from other similar businesses? Yeah, so this is where I covered where I moved from Illumin to Evora. Illumin was what the brand was called earlier, and we focused largely on the design of the product and the sense we got. But when we strategized the entire business, because like you said, there were a lot of other candle brands coming up, especially because of COVID, we, that is when we named it Evora, which is evoking an aura. We brought in the strategy of how we explain emotions through sense and how we also brought it out pictorially on all of our candles with the designs that we brought. Nitra, I hope that answers your question. But before we close, uh, is there any advice you would want to give to the aspiring entrepreneurs looking to enter the eco-conscious market, particularly in the uh, luxury goods sector? Because I think uh, the product that you're selling is slightly premium um, because of the values that you stand up for. Um, 
So is there anything that you wish to share with the audience? Yeah, so sustainability is something that is thriving currently. And there are a lot and a lot of people moving into sustainable as a choice, be it food or the kind of products that they consume. So there's definitely a market for it, even in the market with respect to investment of venture capital firms. There are a lot of climate tech funds that are coming up today. And a lot of these funds believe in investing in growth stage ventures. That's also because of the gestation period it takes to grow into a business. But it is understood in the market that these kind of products are still slightly expensive. And that is why we fall into the luxury goods product, because like I stated the example of soy wax versus paraffin wax, it is 2x the cost. Unfortunately, sustainability today is expensive. Um, it might not be very easy to stand out in the market, but that does not mean that you cannot stand out. When you bring out something, always try and bring out something that you really resonate with the consumers it's all when you build something build something that the consumers want to buy not what you want to sell so when i started off i started off with selling candles but when i understood the game i was trying to understand what do what kind of candles do consumers want to buy so it's always about building what the consumers exactly want with respect to sustainability there is market for it this is a great time to build in this market but just be patient because there's a lot of entrants, but and there are also a lot of other products in the market. It will take some time to crack into it. And as an entrepreneur itself, an advice that I would like to give you is um, eight out of 10 days will be a downfall, but we live for those two days, right? And those two days will cover up for the rest of the eight days that have really uh, made you feel miserable. So every time you feel like giving up, just stop there and look back how far you've come and that will give you a reason to continue. Um, that's something I would like to say to entrepreneurs irrespective of the um, vertical that you're trying to build. But yes, there's definitely scope for sustainability and it's growing. Sanjana, after listening to you, I understand that entrepreneurship, I think primarily comes from a lot of conviction and your willingness to take calculated risk because when you say eight out of 10 days might not work for you but those two days is something that uh, you know keeps you going uh, yeah. it was truly inspiring listening uh, to you and uh, we wish to continue this conversation our students would reach out to you and uh, we would build a story around Ebora. thank you once again on behalf of the department of commerce on behalf of the university and everyone who gathered here uh, I would like to invite Amal Nath and sir, if there is any closing remarks before we conclude. Yes, sir. Sanjana, uh, thank you so much once again. You know, we wish that you come you know, uh, once again to the campus to interact with our students in person whenever you come down to you know, Bangalore. So it was you know, uh, wonderful listening to you, as I said earlier also. I'm sure you know, all our you know, students would have benefited out of. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, sir. I'm also Thank you, Sanjana. Let's be yeah. Come back to the campus. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you all had a good time. Uh, see you all soon and would love to hear from you guys.